Now, Live 22 News, your local election headquarters, brings you the Western Massachusetts Media Consortium United States Senate debate. See and help with the fishing industry with no regulations so they can have a stronger voice. I think that's also an important part of the discussion when it comes to the effects of climate change. Uh, Senator Warren, I'll remind you of the question. Is carbon, a carbon tax a viable option to help this issue here in the United States? So it's clear to me that we need a way to make polluters pay for the damage they do. And there are a lot of different ways we can do that. One, I'll just start right here locally, and that is make GE pay to clean up the Housatonic River. Um, they originally agreed to, and then once Donald Trump was elected, they backed up and said, well, no, let's renegotiate again. And now they don't want to have to move the pollution that they caused out of state. You know, this is one of the consequences, though, of what Mr. Deal wants to do as Donald Trump's campaign chair. When Donald Trump withdrew from the Paris Climate Accords, not a peep from Mr. Deal. When a coal lobbyist was put in as the head of the EPA, not a peep from Mr. Deal. You want to talk about fishing? One of the things that Mr. Deal has said is that he embraces offshore drilling. I want you just to think about that and what that would mean for Massachusetts. We have offshore drilling off the coast of Massachusetts. One spill, like the kind of spills that happened down in the Gulf of Mexico, and all of our fishing industry is wiped out, our tourism industry on the East Coast is wiped out, and a way of life that we have nurtured for centuries will be gone. Look, climate change is real, and it is urgent problem that we need to bear down on it, and we need to bear down on it now. I have a bill to try to push corporations to do more on climate change, time, and I'll stop Thank there. You. Thank you. Have you have one minute for a rebuttal, sir. Sure. So uh, much like the senator who mistakenly thought that I was at a police rally that was some sort of tied to some racist rally, uh, she's also mistaken on saying that I support offshore drilling. In fact, I was on WGBH radio uh, several months ago with Jim and Marjorie talking specifically, and I'm on record as saying I'm against anything that's going to affect our fishermen and the wind turbine placements that we're trying to get done to create more energy here in Massachusetts. Um, the other thing too, uh, affecting the environment that's really bad and I think we need to make sure we focus on is the CFPBs that have been uh, found on military bases right out here, Westfield. Uh, the other thing too is that's also found on turnout gear for firefighters causing uh, health risks for them including cancer and I think uh, companies like DuPont, who are manufacturing and have been responsible for CFPBs, should also be held responsible there. Excellent. Senator, one minute. So I thought that Mr. Deal might want to go with what he said on WGBH to the people of Massachusetts. But on September 26, 2017, when he was on Southern Sense Radio, Mr. Deal said, quote, you have to have all the options on the table. And so to me, offshore drilling any and all places where we can get that energy in a reasonable way, here's his quote, I'm all for. In other words, he goes and says one thing somewhere else, I'm all for offshore drilling. He comes to Massachusetts and says, well, maybe not so much because he thinks the WGBH audience might not be quite so supportive. You know, and he raised the point twice now about the rally that he attended. There was a rally in Bourne organized by Act for America, a group that the Southern Poverty Law Center designated as a hate group and described as, quote, the largest anti-Muslim group in America. He was there on April 22nd, 2018. The photographs actually show the group in the That's background. That's time. That's time. We're going to move on to our next question, which goes to you first, Senator Warren. The American Outdoor Brands Corporation, formerly Smith & Wesson, which is based right here in Springfield, provides needed jobs. At the same time, guns produced in Springfield have been used to harm others elsewhere, including in Parkland, Florida, during a school shooting. How do you balance the need for those jobs and keeping the public safe? Uh, actually, I don't see these two things as in conflict. I think that what we're asking for across America, what our young people are asking for right here in Massachusetts, is some more gun safety so that we have, for example, better background checks, so that people who are on the no-fly list because they're terrorism suspects can't buy guns, so that we close up the loopholes so people can't go down to Virginia and buy guns with no checks at all and bring them back to Massachusetts, so we can look into the research on things like smart guns. You know, this is really a fundamental question about who government works for. 
Right now, across this Commonwealth and across America, people want to see some sensible gun safety rules put in place. After the shooting down in Florida, we saw 14-year-olds, 16-year-olds, 18-year-olds come off the bench and say, please, we don't want to have to worry about being shot at school, being shot on the playground. Please make some changes. And what's happened? It hasn't happened. And why not, even with widespread support, even the simplest kind of measures? No, because the NRA holds Congress hostage. My opponent is endorsed by the NRA. And the NRA endorsement is hangs on the fact that you don't cross the NRA, and that means we won't get gun safety. And I'll jump in there because that's time. Representative, for you, how do you balance the need for these jobs here in Springfield with public safety? Well, the machinists of Springfield, the history here in this uh, city and in the region, obviously important to make sure we keep those jobs here. And I think in Massachusetts, having been a part of the legislature where we have in my opinion, some of the strongest gun laws in the country. I think the next solution is going towards what's called national reciprocity. It's language that's passed through the House currently on its way to the Senate. National reciprocity would allow people, if you're not aware of this, who currently have gun licenses to be able to utilize them in other states, much like how your current driver's license works. Uh, if you go to another state, obviously driving a car, you can do that. If you have a, the right to carry a gun in this state, you should be able to do that as well. And so the uh, the, uh, it, there, I think what happens is we can take some of those laws that we have in Massachusetts that are working and spread that across the rest of the country to create that universal type license. Now, when it comes to safety, of course, I've been endorsed by numerous law enforcement organizations. The Boston Patrolmen's Association has looked at me as someone who clearly understands public safety and law enforcement, and my positions on guns are such that I think we need to have a secure border and so that people aren't coming into our country illegally and then coming into Massachusetts and trafficking illegal guns. They're also going with drugs up to New Hampshire, up to Maine, uh, having straw buyers then provide them guns. They come back and they use them uh, violently here in Massachusetts. I think we need to make sure that our borders are secure and those people who are committing crimes, if they're not here legally, are deported. And that's time. You have one minute. You know, it's not just mass shootings. It's the shootings that occur every day. Eight children and teenagers die every single day in this country from gun violence. It is our responsibility as the adults to change the laws and bring that number down. When my opponent talks about national reciprocity, what he's talking about is let Texas make the rules for who's going to be able to carry a gun here in Massachusetts. That's not going to make us any safer. And the idea that Massachusetts has stronger gun laws than any place else in the country keeps us safe. Yeah, it keeps us relatively safer. But the problem is you can buy a gun in Virginia, put it in the trunk, and drive right back up to Massachusetts so that we can't do this unless we do it on a national scale. The fundamental question, who does government work for? If this were simply about what most of the people in this commonwealth want, and most of the people in this country, we'd have gun safety laws, but the NRA won't permit That's it. That's time for you, sir, one minute. You know, if Senator Warren returns to the Senate, yeah, Texas will be making the rules. But if I go down to the Senate, I'll have a seat at the table because of my relationship with the administration and in a Senate that's uh, majority controlled by Republicans to have that Massachusetts voice of reason when how we deal with guns. Um, it's obvious with Senator Warren that she doesn't even want this position as senator. She wants to be president. We all know that. She's been campaigning in states that are more important to her than Massachusetts. She was in Georgia just last week. Pennsylvania and Oklahoma a couple weekends ago. She's been in Ohio. She's been in Louisiana. And, you know, Senator Warren, yes, if you basically are running for president for the next two years, we won't have a voice down there to provide more gun safety. We will not have somebody who is working for Massachusetts every day because you'll be continuing this two-year campaign to become the nominee for the White House. Thank you, sir. Let's move on. Let's talk about something that's been talked about a lot here in Massachusetts the last two years, the legalization of marijuana. Although many supporters have complained that its rollout has been slow, Massachusetts, as I just said, did legalize recreational marijuana two years ago. Do you see marijuana businesses, Representative Deal, as an important industry for Western Massachusetts? And if so, do you see a need to assure that the federal government won't interfere in this process? 
Yeah, I do. You know, I think this is a state's rights issue. I think that Massachusetts voters spoke very clearly when they legalized not only medicinal marijuana, but also recreational marijuana. Now, my personal feeling is different than I think uh, what the voters decided, but I also honor the will of the voters, like when I led the ballot question to repeal the index gas tax, and thankfully the legislature left that alone. They did not try to intercept it and make changes to it. Uh, the will of the voters was honored. The same thing with the marijuana law. I think it can provide revenue, of course, for the state, and I think it can provide jobs, obviously, uh, in our state as well. Uh, but at the same time, I want to make sure that we don't go about it in a way that's reckless, and I think the legislature has attempted to look at Colorado as a model. Uh, the only thing I would say is I, I think was wrong was when the legislature intercepted the law and made changes to it. They increased the tax on marijuana well above what the ballot question uh, had said it was supposed to be. Uh, and I think what they ended up doing by creating a much higher tax, they, they created a black market that still is going to mean that marijuana is trafficked illegally, undermining, again, the work that our law enforcement officers who put their lives on the line every day to get drugs off our street, undermining what they're doing out there, uh, having to do that, plus uh, undercutting the revenue that we could potentially be bringing in through the new marijuana industry. Senator Warren, for you, do you see a need to make sure that the federal government isn't going to interfere in this process? Absolutely, I see a need for the federal government to be held off from interfering. You know, here's the problem. Massachusetts legalized marijuana, but the federal laws didn't change. So that means as businesses try to grow and establish themselves here in Massachusetts, they face multiple problems. The first one is they can't get their money into the banking system because banks are concerned that the money under federal law comes from illegal sources. They have a problem with taxes because all of their gains are treated as no business expenses because it's treated as unlawful. And of course, there's always the risk that someone could be arrested for possession. So I got together with a Republican from Colorado, the guy who right now is trying to help Republicans take over the Senate. We've worked on a bipartisan basis on a bill that we have written together that says once the state acts, the federal government should back off. It's a good bill. It's got both Democrats and Republicans to support it. Why isn't it law? Because right now the Republican majority with Mitch McConnell won't bring it to a vote. So if we actually want to see this solved, we need a Democratic majority in the Senate. Let's get a vote on this. But you know, this is just one of more than a dozen pieces of legislation that I've worked on since Donald Trump has been elected. Only the good news is on all the others, I've actually managed to get them through and get them signed into law. And I hope we have time to talk about those I have to tonight. leave it there, thank you. You have one minute for a response. Well, look, again, I totally agree that uh, the federal government needs to make sure that the marijuana industry is allowed to grow, not just in our state, uh, but in other states that choose to do this. Uh, I think that the banking industry clearly uh, needs to be given a freer hand so that the marijuana cash is able to be processed. And uh, I think that's something that's been held up for too long. And I think the other thing, too, is that uh, here in Massachusetts, we need to still take a cautious approach because I think law enforcement has really not been able to weigh in on how they're going to deal with things like uh, um, operating under the influence. I mean, we're still trying to figure this out. So it's a, it's still a path that we're trying to figure out as this business sort of was put on us by the, um, by the ballot question. Now, from the federal end of things, uh, I certainly think that again, this goes to show why you need a Republican down there with a Republican-controlled Senate, which I fully estimate this will continue to be after the midterm elections, because taking Massachusetts successes and that perspective down to Washington and being able to convince fellow Republicans across the state and across the country. Thank you very much. One minute. So I've got a good bipartisan bill, but I need some allies. I need some allies down in Washington. And I need them not just on a marijuana law, we need them on all sorts of things. I stood on the floor of the United States Senate when I watched as health care hung by a single vote. And now Mr. Deal wants to go to Washington and be that single vote to repeal health care for tens of millions of Americans. Yeah, I'm trying to help people around the country in other states because I want some allies down in Washington. The best way I can protect health care right here in Massachusetts is to have more people in Washington who care about health care. 
By the way, that repeal of health care that Mr. Deal has embraced, Donald Trump has embraced, the Republicans have embraced, would cost Massachusetts more than $2 billion every single year and repeal the protections for people with pre-existing conditions. This really matters. Senator Warren, thank you. And the next question does start with you. We'll talk about Social Security, please. So there are 15 years until Social Security is expected to pay 80 cents on the dollar. Do you see a way to fix the system to avoid those benefits being reduced? So I appreciate the question, but I actually think the frame a little bit with respect is in the wrong place. The Republicans just gave away a trillion and a half dollars to giant corporations and billionaires through a tax scam. And now the debt has ballooned. And what have the Republicans said is the appropriate response? Now it's time to put Social Security and Medicare on the chopping block. That's the Republican plan. Not wait, not strengthen it, put it on the chopping block. So let me just stop right here and say I will never vote to cut Social Security. I will never vote to cut Medicare. These are basic programs that people have paid for that they are entitled to. The idea that the Republicans are running a scam saying we're gonna give billions of dollars away to giant corporations that now have record tax and pro record profits and then turn around and take it out on the backs of people who collect Social Security and rely on Medicare. We don't need to cut Social Security and Medicare. We need to expand it. I have already introduced legislation. I introduced it years ago to say as we need to move forward on making Social Security stronger financially, but make sure it's there for every one of our seniors. After a lifetime of hard work, you should be entitled and to that's retire time. with dignity. Thank you very much. Sir, do you see a way to fix the system so that benefits to Social Security won't be reduced? It's happening right now. In fact, my opponent has vowed to repeal the very mechanism that is refilling Social Security and Medicare. The tax reform of 2017, which she voted against, which she has vowed to repeal, has now created new jobs, has created increased wages that create the payroll taxes that go in to refill. Now, we as a country are starting to see in just a year the effects of this tax reform bill giving us 4.1 GDP record unemployment 50 years since we've had unemployment at the level it's at now massachusetts is actually beating the national number on unemployment massachusetts is benefiting greatly 80 percent of massachusetts residents received a tax cut because of this tax reform bill but senator warren joined uh, Nancy Pelosi in calling it crumbs, saying that the people were <laughs> not getting what they were, they were due, which is finally a break from federal government. So we're seeing people now having more jobs, uh, having higher wages, and in Massachusetts, our state revenue has exceeded $1.2 billion in unanticipated tax revenue because of all the investment companies are putting into it. And by the way, I want to add, my wife and I own a small business. We invested our life savings to start it. We've had it for 16, almost 17 years now. And you know what? It's time for government to finally help us from the largest corporate rate in the world to allowing us to finally reinvest in our businesses. 90% of businesses in our country are 20 employees or lower. They're benefiting right now. We have to leave right it now. there, sir. Thank you. In your rebuttal, uh, Senator Warren, some people have suggested raising the retirement age to 72 as a solution to this. What do you think? I think that's the wrong approach. I think the right approach is that we put the money into Social Security that it takes to meet our obligations. But let's be clear. What the Republicans want to do is just run a scam on the American people. And the scam starts by cutting revenues to the federal government. You know, the idea that somehow the federal government's getting richer, check the facts on this. The debt is going up and the Republicans are saying openly, this isn't even a secret, time to put Social Security and Medicare on the chopping block. That's people, what they depend on. So for me, this one is easy. This tax break was a scam from the beginning. Exxon alone, one company, 
gets more in tax breaks than 95% of all the people in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Those breaks didn't go to small businesses. They went to giant businesses because that's who the Republicans want government to work for. Representative, in your rebuttal, the same question, raising the retirement age to 72. Is that something you would be in favor of? No, it's not something we should do. In fact, the government is taking in record revenue. They've never taken in more tax re revenue than before. However, what's needed is sending someone to Washington that's going to also do this tougher part of cutting spending. Now, on Beacon Hill, I took on special interest to repeal the index gas tax when I knew that we were wasting billions of dollars of taxpayer money. It wasn't going where it was supposed to. 50% of the gas tax at the time was going to the MBTA, which had $6 billion of deferred maintenance. Their pension fund was upside down. They were asking us to backfill it over and over again. One year we found out a year later that $25 million had been stolen by a fund manager that worked for the MBTA pension fund, then went to work for another company uh, to take that money. So look, Government has the revenue in. You just have the fiscal discipline to try to make sure it's spent where it's supposed to go. That's why you need to send someone who is willing to stand up to things like the Olympics. Senator Warren, her rating on cutting spending, zero. You have to leave it there. Thank you. And the next question does go to you, Representative. President Trump, whom you've said you've supported, has called people names. He's called them horseface on Twitter. He's called them flakes. He's used ethnic slurs. Does the name calling and personal attacks that are common in Washington these days lead to effective governing, in your opinion? And if elected, would you do anything to combat these types of attacks? You know, Carrie, it is disappointing to see how Washington is functioning now. I certainly don't follow the same path that the president does on how I legislate, uh, how I deal with people. Uh, but at the same time, my opponent has made comments that are pretty disturbing as well. She said that anybody who voted for the president was part of an ugly stew of racists, okay? She said that when Republicans wanted to try to fix health care, that we wanted blood money from the American people. She's, you know, called to abolish ICE. And you know what? When you have rhetoric that undercuts law enforcement, you end up having people like a Cambridge supporter of hers who put a $500 bounty if somebody would shoot somebody from ICE. Okay, that's how low things have gotten. I want to be a different voice. I have not enact, acted like that up on Beacon Hill. I certainly won't follow the path of Senator Warren on trying to villainize and pit us together. That's not what our country needs right now. And I want to make sure that when I go down to Washington, we follow by example on that. Now, at the same time, if you look at the president and his track record, I will say that we are finally seeing economic benefits from him being in office. We are seeing international benefits. You know, a year ago, we had North Korea threatening our allies with nuclear weapons. And now, a year later, we're seeing them having repeated meetings with South Korea, even thinking about doing the Olympics with them, which I also don't think is a financially good idea. Thank you. Uh, Senator Warren, for your part, you've often criticized President Trump and his name calling. Yet your campaign sent out an email in May titled, quote, Mick Mulvaney the Mosquito, and that went on to say, calling members of the president's staff, quoting here, bloodsuckers and henchmen. How do you justify calling President Trump out for his name calling, but then using language like that? Okay, so look, we called him a mosquito. You're right. And, um, but here's the deal. What we're really talking about is hatefulness against groups against how it is that you pick the most vulnerable and really go after them. And, you know, I understand. My opponent stands here. He sounds reasonable. He says this is not how he wants to behave. But just look at his own record and who he's been supporting. He toured the border with the leader of a group that associates with white supremacists and wants to return this country to a time when, quote, gays were in the closet and blames Jews for 9-11. He attended a rally organized by the largest anti-Muslim hate group. He supported naming Black Lives Matter as a hate group. He defended Trump's racist attacks against a Latino federal judge. Look, he stayed on as Trump's campaign chairman even after the Access Hollywood tapes came out. He got the endorsement of Vice President Pence, who spearheaded legislation to permit discrimination against LGBTQ people. You know, that's ultimately what this is about. This is about ugly slurs. And who's going to support that kind of ugliness that turns Americans against Americans, that turns people against people, that says if there's a problem in your life, it's their fault? 
That's what Donald Trump and his campaign chair, Mr. Deal, both support. We should leave it there. Representative, yes, one sir. minute. Now, Senator Warren was just at a rally against Justice Kavanaugh with Linda Sorsor, one of the most noted anti-Semitic voices in the United States right now. That's who she likes to hang out with. And just so you know, Senator Warren herself is the one of the main reasons that we have this lack of dialogue, this poisonous political environment down there. Talk about pitting people against them. There are law enforcement officers in this room that you called racist from front to back. You said that the criminal justice system is racist from front to back. Now, I want to know who's exempt from that because you've tried to back away from that statement. Whether it's lawmakers who make the laws, whether it's the judges, the prosecutors, whether it's the law enforcement officers, whether it's the corrections officers that are sitting right here, which one of them is racist or which one isn't? But when you said from front to back, you said they're all racist. And what that does is it creates division and anger in our country, in our state, and undermines law enforcement, puts their lives at risk. We've had four officers killed, two shot and two killed. We have to leave it there, sir. Thank you. One minute. So I didn't call anyone a name like that. And you know that. Here's the deal, though. We've got heroes who work in law enforcement, who work in the judiciary, who work in every part of the criminal justice system, and I work hard to support them. But we also have a serious problem in the criminal justice system. Let's just look at the data for the exact same crimes. Study after study shows that African Americans are more likely than whites to be arrested to be prosecuted, to be found wrongfully convicted, and to receive harsher sentences. We have a problem in the system. And frankly, that problem starts right down in Congress with the things that we make unlawful. And it goes all the way through the system to how we treat people after they've served time and they're trying to come back into their communities and be part of them. We need to have a grown-up conversation, a real conversation about this. Thank you. Our next question will focus on Hurricane Maria. Destruction from Hurricane Maria saw people flee the island and relocate to western Massachusetts. And there are still families here in the region without permanent housing. Senator, should elected representatives be doing more to help Puerto Rican natives? Absolutely. Our, our representatives should be doing much more to help Puerto Rico. But I actually want to start this earlier in time because I have been working with people in Puerto Rico long before Maria hit. Puerto Rico has a terrible debt problem where Wall Street vulture investors have been picking the bones clean of their economy and keeping it from moving forward. And then when Maria hit and Donald Trump gave such a pathetic response, basically turned his back on American citizens. And again, I never heard any complaint from his campaign chair, Mr. Deal. We hurt our fellow citizens. Many had to flee the island. Some came right here to Massachusetts. Now, I have pushed from the very beginning to get housing, to get assistance that we need for people who've been displaced, as well as help for people on the island in rebuilding their infrastructure. The Trump administration has balked, turned, denied, twisted at every single point and refused to do it. I've been to Puerto Rico in person since the uh, since Maria hit. I took a delegation. Congressman Neal was with us. We were there to visit. We were there to try to learn firsthand what was happening. And what was happening was shameful. It never should have happened that our fellow citizens would be left behind after such a devastating event. Representative, do you uh, agree with the Trump administration's response to what happened in Puerto Rico? You know, Senator Warren's response shows just how obsessed she is with Donald Trump and will use a natural disaster to try to poke at him any way we can. He, she can. Senator Warren, Donald Trump's not here in Massachusetts, and when you're campaigning around the country all the time, neither are you. But I'm here in Massachusetts. I understand what's going on. I've certainly talked to the Puerto Rican community that lives in central areas like Boston or in Lawrence. In fact, when the Lawrence disaster happened, when the gas line explosions occurred in Lawrence, Andover, and North Andover, I was up there that night. You were out of the state, as usual, not in Massachusetts to be there when they needed him. I know you came the next day with a governor for photo ops, but I was out there with the National Guard giving out hot plates when you were in Pennsylvania and Oklahoma campaigning. I was giving camp showers to family members who couldn't have showers working uh, because 
the gas lines weren't up and the, the heat wasn't working. I've been here dealing with natural disasters right in Massachusetts when the time hits. And you want to blame President Trump so that you can continue to raise your profile to make a run for the White House. Well, great. Score those points every day you can. But helping people in Massachusetts, that's what it's supposed to be all about. That's what I'm all about. Senator, one minute. So my opponent actually may want to check the facts. Uh, when the explosion occurred, I was in Washington, D.C., voting and doing my job. Uh, and I got on an airplane as soon as I could and got back to Massachusetts. I was speaking that night to people who were part of the disaster relief. But look, here's the fundamental question. Who does Mr. Deal want to go to Washington to work for? He says he wants to work for the people of Massachusetts but he repeatedly defends Donald Trump. He cheerleads for Donald Trump. Donald Trump's response to a disaster relief was to throw rolls of paper towels at people in Puerto Rico. Donald Trump's response was to give himself an A and claim that only a handful of people were killed in the disaster instead of the actual number of people. And where is Mr. Deal every time? He's there to cheer Donald Trump on. You say that Donald Trump is not here. The big question is, are we going to send somebody to Washington to cheer on Donald Trump? Representative. I, I guess we've moved on from the Puerto Rican disaster and on to Donald Trump. Please bring us back to it. What would your... Sure. And again, this shows just how much uh, one person seems to be completely fixated on a president that she can't work with uh, in a Congress that obviously she doesn't feel is doing their job. I mean, she wants to change it over to Democrat control. And yet at the same time, we've got Republicans that are effectively leading this country, uh, bringing us back economically. And we're seeing, uh, you know, a resurgence in the American workforce. And that's giving us, again, revenue in this state that's allowing us to provide the needs when there's disasters right here in Massachusetts. And at the same time, provide our country the revenue we need to respond to Puerto Rico, a country that is obviously economically having tough times. I mean, really, really tough times. And I'm glad that Massachusetts was able to send response teams down to help in Puerto Rico. Uh, I certainly look forward to going to Washington and making sure that the citizens of this state, if they come from Massachusetts or if they came from another country and are citizens now, that their home country is taken care of as well. Representative, you said in Friday's televised debate that Senator Warren's Native American heritage doesn't matter to you, but do you think it has an impact on her job performance or ability to represent Massachusetts in Washington? Excuse me, I'll remind you, I'll remind you, sir, that we've asked you to be quiet. Sorry for that interruption. Thank you so Not much. And so the question was, do you think that Senator Warren's Native American heritage impacts her ability to represent Massachusetts and Washington? You know, Carrie, it's not about Senator Warren's ancestry. It's about integrity in my mind. And I don't care whether you think you benefited or not from that claim. It's the fact that you tried to benefit from that claim that I think bothers a lot of people and it has been something that you have been unable to put to rest since the 2012 campaign. Look, I don't care what percentage she claims to be Native American. I just care that I'm 100 percent for Massachusetts and will be working for the people of this state. And that's all I have to say on that issue. Senator, when we spoke in March for an interview and I asked you about whether or not you would take a DNA test. You, you told me that you believed that the issue of your Native American heritage had been settled. Why did you change your mind and recently release the results of a DNA test? You know, one of the things I see now is that confidence in government is at an all-time low. And I believe one way that we try to rebuild confidence is through transparency. So I've really made an effort over the past several months I've put 10 years of my tax returns online. Anybody can see them. I have put uh, uh, things about my family history online. I have, you to not interrupt the candidate. I have, Continue. I have put my employment record 
online, and yeah, ultimately I took a DNA test because I am an open book, and it's all out there, it's on the internet, anybody can take a look. Because at the end of the day, this isn't about me. This is about what's happening to working families all across this Commonwealth. Look, I'm not somebody who ever ran for office before, but I'll tell you why I ran. I, I'm a kid who wanted to be a public school teacher. And by the time I graduated from high school, we didn't have the money for a college application, much less a chance for me to actually go to college. A lot of twists and turns in my story, but my big chance was a commuter college that cost $50 a semester. And it opened a million doors for me. I am the daughter of someone who ended up as a janitor, and I got to be a professor and a United States senator. Those opportunities are disappearing for other kids. I'm in this fight for them. Representative, I'll give you a chance for an extra minute if you'd like it. I know you said that you were finished with that issue. Well, look, she's obviously talked about her background. I think people should know that I didn't get into politics until I was 40 years old. I felt it was a calling. It was not a career. My wife and I own a small business. Uh, I was on the finance committee in my town, but I felt like the system on Beacon Hill wasn't working for the people of my district that I ultimately was elected to represent. Now, I've actually cut taxes since I've been in office because that was one of the things I felt was important to give people a chance to get ahead. Now, my opponent has proposed things that will massively increase people's taxes. And by the way, there's only one millionaire with a mansion in this room right now, up here, and that is Senator Warren, who, by the way, falsified her tax returns, calling them entry errors when she took a $50,000 deduction for clothing. $50,000. I don't even have that type of clothing in my house with a wife and two daughters. Uh, but that was the entry she put in to reduce her own taxes. So it is about a system that may be rigged. And unfortunately, we have a senator who seems to be we using that system. We have to leave it system. there. You have one minute for rebuttal. So, you know, Mr. Deal says he's not a millionaire. But here's the truth. There's actually no way of actually knowing that because his taxes are uh, not online. He hasn't revealed them. He keeps it all secret. Yeah, he's filled out the disclosures, disclosures with huge ranges. So you really just don't know what's going on. In fact, Mr. Deal has revealed exactly the same number of tax returns that Donald Trump has, and that's zero. But look, for me, what this is really about is are we going to be transparent about who we work for? I put everything out on the internet, and you're right. There's a mistake in my taxes. It made no difference in how much I owed. There is an entry error, and there may be some other mistakes in it. But I put it out there for people to see because I don't want this fight to be about me. I want this fight to be about the next kid who needs a chance to go to school. I want it to be about the kids who need health care. I want it to be about people who are about to retire. And that's that's time. what should matter to us. Our next question is about commuter rail service. Commuter rail service from Western Massachusetts east uh, to Boston is seen by many here as a necessity. What, if anything, do you think that Congress should do to secure money for the potential project? Oh, so this is one of my priorities. I'm so glad you asked about this. And that is to make the investments in infrastructure so that we can get high-speed rail from Boston to Worcester to Springfield. And by the way, if we're doing infrastructure investment, we also need to make sure that we're investing in communications uh, so that all of the Berkshires is covered on communications. You can't be part of a 21st century economy without that. But here's the problem again. The Republicans have given away a trillion and a half dollars to the most profitable corporations, to billionaires. And so when they talk about, oh yeah, they've got some infrastructure plan, turns out it's not real. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's all about, oh, well, let's see, the federal government will put up $1 if the localities can put up $4. And how will the federal government even put up that $1? Well, actually, the way it's going to work is they're going to keep the money that otherwise had been going to cities right here, like Springfield. You know, we just can't keep doing this. This is this fundamental question, who do you think government should work for? The Republicans, Donald Trump, Mr. Deal, says make it work 
better and better for a thinner and thinner slice at the top. Instead of making the investments in infrastructure that we need right here in Western Massachusetts, in education, in building a future for everyone. And that's time. What, if anything, do you think should be done at this level to secure rail funding east to west? You know, Senator Warren, I talked before this started about how we both we're in traffic to get here for the debate and I can feel the pain because I've been out there on my campaign RV uh, driving around the state for over a year talking to people and when we're driving from let's say Agawam up to uh, Pittsfield sometimes you lose your Wi-Fi sometimes you lose uh, your cell phone connection we do need communications infrastructure because communications infrastructure will allow central and western Massachusetts to bring some of the businesses that are currently overcrowding Eastern Massachusetts. It's great that the seaport in Boston has GE and has MedTech and these companies that are coming in and building, you know, new headquarters in Boston is wonderful. But there's a lot of people who need those opportunities, those jobs in central and western Massachusetts. So if we have the communications infrastructure, that incentivizes the businesses to come out here. As far as rail, I totally agree. Now, obviously, the first thing you have to think about is the fact that we're currently having a tough time affording the rail system we have. So maybe we look at private partnerships to get rail back out here. That's how this country and this state first started, private industry. I know Senator Warren says that you didn't build that when she first ran for office. She said it was government roads. Well, I have to tell you, it was the uh, machine shops in Springfield and Holyoke. It was the shoe factories in Brockton. It was the fishing industry of Gloucester and New Bedford. That's what built the private schools and the private hospitals that first took care of people, provided the money to build those roads. We need to make sure businesses are given the chance to grow as well so we can have those funds to build the roads. Thank you. And Senator, one minute. So this is the standard Republican playbook. Say that you're all in favor of infrastructure. Somehow the public sector doesn't really have to put up the money. The private sector is going to do it. And guess what? The infrastructure never gets built. And that's exactly where we find ourselves in Western Massachusetts. How many times have politicians like Mr. Deal stood up and said over and over, yeah, we need that high-speed rail. I'm totally in favor of that high-speed rail. But when it comes down to it, won't vote to be to put the funds in so that you can actually build the high-speed rail. Look, we ought to be putting real money in at the federal government level, and we could do that, except for the fact that the Republicans, Mr. Deal, Donald Trump, have given away a trillion and a half dollars to billionaires and giant corporations. It's the ultimate question of who government works for. It shouldn't be working just for the rich and the powerful. Infrastructure is how we build a future for all of us. Representative, one minute. Sure. Well, look, I know about infrastructure. When we did the gas tax ballot question in 2014, we knew exactly where a lot of money was going and where it should have been going and where too much money was going. In fact, in Massachusetts, we're number two to New Jersey for what we spend to maintain our roads. And so when we want to build rail, we need to have the money available and not waste it in other areas. Massachusetts spends $675,000 per mile per year to maintain our roads. Now, the national average is $145,000 per mile per year. All right, that's New Hampshire. They pay the national average. Their roads are in pretty good shape. Massachusetts could be spending their money more efficiently. That would leave us the money to put it where we need it, whether it's going to be improving the rail system that we have that had $6 billion of deferred maintenance over the last decade, or whether it's making sure that we can try new lines to get more service, to get more people to and from job locations that are going to help grow the economy and pay the taxes that build the rail. You have the right to answer the next question. Census data tells us that the Hispanic population in Western Massachusetts is growing. And according to the Pew Research Center, the number of Hispanics eligible to vote has steadily grown, yet their voting in midterm elections has declined since 2006, according to Pew. Have you taken steps to reach out to minority voters while you've been campaigning? Well, sure. I mean, of course, when you're going out uh, talking to people on a campaign trail, you attend parades, you go door to door, you go to different communities. Of course, I've been to uh, Lawrence. I've talked to a lot of people there during their festivals. I've been to New Bedford, uh, marching in their parades, talking to the uh, residents there. Uh, people of all races. It's not, to me, uh, campaigning about trying to reach just one segment. But I will say, you know, as far as the Hispanic community and not voting, that's not good to hear. And perhaps they're feeling the same thing a lot of people are feeling, disgust 
with the people that are currently elected, the disgust with Washington and the way it's functioning, maybe distrust with Beacon Hill and how they don't seem to be looking after the interests of the people. We have more and more ballot questions going on every year. Instead of legislators actually doing their job, we have to decide nursing levels. We have to decide marijuana laws. You know, what, casinos had to be put in the hands of the people. Why aren't lawmakers doing what they're supposed to be doing? So if any one segment of our state is not happy with politicians and politics, I get it. Uh, but uh, hopefully, you know, in this case, people look at me, regardless of their background, and say, here's someone who has been fighting to make sure they have more money in their pocket, make sure the jobs are out there. And I certainly welcome uh, anybody from the Hispanic community to support my campaign and make sure that I'm working for them down in Washington. Senator, has your campaign done things to reach out to minority voters as look, you've been on the trail? We don't just do this during campaign. Of course we have. But I try to live this every single day. Um, I live it with who's on my staff, uh, and I live it with every activity that we take. We try to be a very inclusive office and try to get people involved everywhere. Um, you know, though, I think that Mr. Deal's going to have a problem in this campaigning if people realize that he defended Donald Trump's racist attacks on a Latino federal judge back when Donald Trump was running for office and Mr. Deal was his campaign chair. And every time Donald Trump gets up and talks about the problems in Mexico and the problems he sees about Mexicans, he's saying to the Latino community here in the United States that he doesn't respect them. And Mr. Deal does not speak up. He does not push back on that. But that's really the core part. He turns to the question about voting. Voting is really a problem right now in the United States. We now have one political party in the United States, the Republicans, whose plan to hold on to power is to keep American citizens from voting. Voter suppression by telling people it just doesn't matter, everybody in Washington is the same. Voter suppression with voter ID laws. Voter suppression with gerrymandering. Voter suppression by saying they don't want to hear about the Russian interference. Mr. Deal has spoken up on exactly zero of those problems. You have one minute. You know, I think Senator Warren wants to cherry pick looking at my record and overlooking things like the fact that I've tried to speed up immigration in Massachusetts. When I was on the Ways and Means Committee for four years on Beacon Hill, I heard the same testimony from the Department of Immigration and Refugees about the backlog of people trying to become citizens. And I want to make sure anybody from every country that's eligible can come in and become a citizen right here in Massachusetts, right here in our country. And what I heard from that Ways and Means testimony from the Department of Refugees and Immigrants was that with the eligible population of about 300,000 people in our state at the time, with the budget that they were given from the federal and state government, they were only able to process about 1,500 people a year. 1,500. So it's an artificial backlog that Congress is unwilling to tackle, unwilling to fix. I want to go to Washington and make sure that we speed up immigration so that people who want to be citizens who want to be part of this thriving economy that's going so well that Senator Warren obviously wants to take backwards. I want to make sure they become citizens. We need to leave it there. Thank you. You have one minute to respond. So I just want to talk about something I've actually been able to do for young Latinos and for young African Americans. And that is 4,500 people right here in Massachusetts who got cheated by for-profit colleges. I helped get all of their student loan debt erased. And that means that their lives will be a lot better. They're going to have a chance to go to school to build their lives without that student loan debt. I managed to get $700 million that will be available for student loan debt forgiveness for people who go into public service. That's teachers, that's firefighters, that's police officers, that's people in public service. And that debt burden disproportionately right now is borne by Latinos and by African Americans and by kids who are just trying to make something out of their lives. So for me, this isn't just about doing something in the abstract or doing something in election season. It's something I live every single day. We are short on time, but do we have time for one more quick question with one minute responses? According to the Pioneer Institute, it's easier for out-of-state students to get accepted to the University of Massachusetts than it is for Massachusetts residents. What, if anything, Senator Warren should be done about that disparity? So look, I think this is about money. Uh, and admitting students are going to pay higher tuition bills. This is the fundamental problem. 
We need to help young people who want to get an education, whether it's technical training, whether it's two years, whether it's four years, whether it's an advanced degree. It's like the investment in infrastructure. It helps build a future for all of us when people can get an education. I went to a commuter college that cost $50 a semester. There's nothing even close to that in Massachusetts right now. Why? Because the investments are not made in young people who need help to get an education. Instead, we've got a trillion and a half dollar student loan debt burden Because in of America. time, I'm sorry, we have to leave it there. You'll get equal time, Representative. Sure. Well, look, first of all, I think one way to make college more affordable so that the colleges aren't spending a ton of money and kids aren't able to go is make sure that we don't have jobs teaching positions that pay $350,000 to teach just one course. I think that might be one way to make it more affordable. And by the way, really disappointing to see Harvard involved in a discrimination situation when it comes to admissions at their college. Um, taking people not because of the best and brightest, but because they want to change the, the the dynamic mix of the state. And it's to be, to me, education should be out there for people who deserve it because they've worked hard to get there. And one last thing on this, I think state schools should give preference to Massachusetts residents, and I think that's where I stand on the position. And that's time, thank you. Closing statements, one minute. This country is in trouble. Healthcare hangs by a thread right now. Student loan debt burden, people are getting crushed. Um, the Republicans are threatening to cut Social Security. And infrastructure is falling apart around us. The projects we need have been set aside. And yet, what's been the Republican response? Try to repeal health care. And at a time when corporate profits are through the roof, give a trillion and a half dollars to giant corporations and billionaires. That just puts us further and further behind. Look, the way I see it, the House is on fire. And Mr. Deal wants to go to Washington to be a cheerleader for Donald Trump, to defend him when he makes ugly slurs, and to embrace every one of his dangerous policies. Not me. I got in this fight because I think Washington works great for those at the top. I just want to make it work for everyone else. One minute. Well, I think we've seen, again, that my opponent is fixated on Donald Trump. She's fixated on the White House and not your house. And that's what I want to do, work for the people of Massachusetts. I'll say it uh, again. I want to be your full-time senator, something that she won't even commit to on national television here. She won't admit that she's actually running for president, that if she were to be reelected, she would redshirt the next two years going around the country trying to campaign when we need a voice down in Washington. The only thing that matters to me, the only thing is the needs of the people of Massachusetts. That's my track record for the last eight years in the legislature, and that's going to be my track record for six years in Washington if I'm given the opportunity. I will make sure that government works more efficiently, more accountability, and make sure that we stop the poisonous politics that have infected that city and made such a difficult time for Republicans and Democrats to work together. This seat was once held by Ted Kennedy, who would work with Republican presidents and Republican governors to deliver. That's the record I want to have. And that's time. Thank you very much. And that is all the time we have for tonight. On behalf of the Western Mass Media Consortium, thank you again to the candidates, for our audience, and for you at home joining us. Thank you, and good night. And you were just watching Senator Elizabeth Warren and her challenger, Jeff Deal, uh, debate for United States Senate here in Massachusetts. Deal, uh, if you missed any part of the debate, we'll have a full recap of the key moments tonight on 22 News at 10 and after the game on NBC. We also have a few upcoming debates to tell you about. The second congressional district debate will take place this Tuesday, and the Worcester, Hamden, Hampshire, and Middlesex Senate debate will take place this Wednesday. Both debates will run on 22 News from 1230 to 1 o'clock, and it will be available to stream online and on our website. Have a good night, everyone.